Hi, everybody. My name is Donna Rubin, and welcome to Matt Chat. This is our third segment of our Celebrity Yoga Teacher Series. I started this series because I really wanted to get to know all the people that make up the yoga community uh, just a little bit better. Whenever, you know, we see a teacher take a class or in a class with other people, you know, we know them, but we don't really know them. And so this gives me the opportunity to really, you know, dive in a little bit deeper, get to know a little more information. But honestly, all the people that are what I call celebrity, the reason why I call them celebrity is just because they have done so much work around the field of yoga in every way. And my guest today is Ida Jo, and she is someone who has a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. Her and her husband, Scott, who's not with us right now, actually, but we'll be doing a separate little chat with Scott as well. They were participating in our first yoga teacher training program, and they will be participating in our upcoming teacher training program. So I'd like to just give you a little background because I, I wouldn't be able to go over every detail of her amazing career. Ida has earned a master's degree in the traditions of yoga and meditation from the London University and awarded degrees with distinction. She is also has the title Yoga Acharya, Master of Yoga by the Shivananda Yoga Vedanta Center, has studied therapeutic and prescriptive yoga at the Gosha's Yoga College of India in Calcutta. And we'll probably go in a little bit more into that, but if anyone doesn't already know, Vishnu Gosh and the Gosh College of India is where Vikram Chowdhury began his career as a yogi. They have also studied advanced yoga programs with forest yoga. They've studied with uh, Tony Sanchez, intermediate and advanced. But what I find the most phenomenal, and I just love this, is the fact that they have actually published the lost manuscript of the 84 yoga asanas by Buddha Bose. And they have also published four what they call Ghosh Yoga Practice Manuals. And these manuals strive to clarify and simplify the purpose and practice of over 100 postures and therapeutic exercises. So, like I said, I'm not going to go over every little detail of their phenomenal career, her and her husband. Let's get to know Ida Jo. So, welcome, Ida. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, Donna. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk with you a little bit. Oh, good, 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 good. And I enjoyed meeting you when we first came a few years ago. And uh, so, this is going to be wonderful. I think you've done way more training since that time so you, you even have more knowledge what was your background or who were you before you actually started your whole yoga journey sure well my background before I got into yoga was that I was a musician still am but I grew up studying music specifically I studied classical violin so even as a kid um, and in my undergrad, music was what I was entirely devoted to. That was kind of interesting when I started getting into yoga because there were so many similarities, I think, to the approach of studying something like a classical music instrument or a classical art form. Um, I know you can speak to that, Donna, with dance. And so I think that there were a lot of elements of, of music and in my case, a violin that kind of transferred over into yoga or made me appreciate a discipline like yoga once, once it came into my life. So that's, you were pursuing a career, like a professional career at that time? Were you, were you uh, in school and everything to become a, a professional musician? I was, yeah, I was. And that was always sort of my, my goal. And I've worked in various sort of um, professional music settings. I think if if anyone <laughs> listening or watching this has worked in music, they're all very different, uh, the jobs that you get. And it's it's very much a matter of kind of making it up as you go. But that was my goal for a long time. And it stayed my goal for a long time to work in music. But 
there was something about having to perform in front of people that that didn't always sit right with me that it it started to feel at times like I had to sort of promote myself so much in a way that that didn't sit right with me. And so I still um, pursue music and play music, but my relationship with it has has changed a little bit. That's so interesting because I sort of found that similarity with mm. my performing career at a certain mm -hmm. point that it kind of felt that something was kind of missing. And also yes. I sort of felt like it was a little bit too much all about me because being a performer is all about you. And it's kind of lonely a little bit as well because you're at home and you're practicing and everything. And then when you actually perform, you don't really have the, the there is a communication with you in the audience, but it's not really a personal connection, a one-on-one -on -one connection. And I, mm -hmm. I, I totally relate to that because it just mm -hmm. started to feel a little bit, I don't know, just something was not quite right. Even though I love it, believe me, don't get me wrong. I love performing, but yeah. Exactly, that's how, that's the same thing where there's elements of it that I also really love and still do, but yeah, something starts to feel off sometimes in those situations where your relationship to your art shifts. And especially I think when you're trying to make a living off of it, it can be really challenging. Um, because that throws in a whole nother dimension that that you need to be paid for it, but it's art and it's something you love, and it's a tri really tricky uh, scenario to navigate. I think, especially over a long period of time. No, I agree totally. Yeah, it's really interesting actually that you said that. So mm -hmm. then here you were a performer, your passion, mm -hmm. your love, and then so how did you stumble upon yoga? How did you get into yoga? What brought you to yoga? First of all, I forgot to ask you, where were you actually from? Where are you from? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I'm from northern Minnesota, um, kind of a smaller town called Duluth, um, right on Lake Superior. But when I got into yoga, I was living in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so still very Midwestern, but slightly bigger, <laughs> bigger city. Um, I had studied music there and I was working there. So I was in that sort of music circle in Madison and in the Midwest, really. And I, I got into yoga, not thinking too much of it. I took class. I started taking class. I came to love and adore the 26 and two sequence. Um, I started practicing at a studio in Madison that's still there today called Inner Fire Yoga and just got really into the practice. And I, I think that that's where that sort of classical violin mentality came in that if you're going to practice, to me, that meant you practice and it's daily and it's disciplined. And so that was kind of um, how I got into yoga, which was just fully in to it, into the practice of it. And at that point, I had no intention of teaching. I think that most people or, or perhaps at least many people say that, that when they you know, they started, they didn't anticipate teaching, but at a certain point, there was a desire to learn more, you know, just to go a bit deeper or learn more. And then that's sort of when I started to transition into thinking about, well, maybe I would teach this, or at least I'll explore what it might mean to teach. Thinking back of when I was practicing, it was a lovely just, you know, practice that was for me, for you know, to be healthier, be stronger, feel better, be disciplined. Um, and, and I didn't think much more of it at that point. So were you, would you say that uh, it was sort of the physical benefits that were sort of the more the appealing part at the beginning of your career? I mean, did you like, what sort of appealed to you about the idea of even going into a yoga class? Did somebody drag you there? Did you just stumble in the door? Like what, you know, what gave you mm -hmm. that sort of initial impetus to walk in the door? I think that it was a mostly physical, that this idea of a little bit of exercise, but in a peaceful sort of setting appealed to me. But when I was a kid, when I was younger, there were different periods of time where my mom would go to yoga classes. And so I can, I have little memories of, of that happening. So it wasn't like it was a very foreign thing to me. Um, and I was interested in just trying out things in the community, trying out different places. And I stumbled upon this one. I think I saw it advertised in the yoga journal. If I recall, that was how I found this particular studio. 
and um, you know, just kind of on a whim decided to try it. And it was, I think, the physical that hooked me at first, especially in the 26 and two sequence where, you know, I think there's this universal experience of you take your first class and you think what just happened, <laughs> you know, and, and you can't do it really, but you see other people who can in the room and that's really piques your interest. Like how come they can do it? And I'm just trying to stand here and I can't even do that. So I think the physical really captured my interest at first, but I think it wasn't too long um, before it felt more than that. And I have a one specific memory of, of realizing that I could figure out how to work really hard in the class, but I couldn't figure out how to relax. And that really intrigued me that like, okay, I know that I can, you know, sit down deeply in chair pose and hold it, but can I just stand here or lay here and relax? And that was really, I think the step towards something different than just physical exercise. What is it mentally or um, what is what is that sort of block that it's easier to exert effort than it is to relax? At least in my case, it was. And that sort of led into these other questions and practices, I think a little bit more subtle practices than approaching it just as exercise. Well, that's, I mean, that's so interesting that you say that because for me, again, I could say it was exactly the same kind of realization mm -hmm. um, where I, of course, being a dancer, loved to do the postures and wanted yeah. to do the postures as well as I could, but I could not stay still on my mat. <laughs> and whenever we came around to Savasana and the teacher would mm -hmm. say, okay, stay still, I didn't think they were talking to me. <laughs> I thought they were talking right. to somebody else. And I was like, well, I don't need to stay still. I just didn't even get it. Okay. Right. And the day that I got it was like, was like eye opening. It was life changing because it just mm -hmm. triggered something in my brain where I realized, just like you said, that there was something else there. But you know mm -hmm. what? It comes at your own timing it comes when you yes. are ready to be able to understand something like that and that's mm -hmm. what I, I love about yoga is that everybody's on their own you know trajectory and there's no mm -hmm. no set time no set anything you know it just mm -hmm. comes as it comes so mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. so how so then okay so now you're in a yoga practice you're you're loving it you're starting to understand the different subtleties of it and something and stuff so then how would you say this yoga practice has then changed your life. What happened with the yoga practice, both personally for yourself and then possibly, you know, your your career and your transformation? Sure. Well, I think the physical and mental benefits really changed me in the sense that I used to get sick very easily, you know, overexert sort of this theme of working really hard, overexerting. Um, and then I would wear myself out and kind of get sick. And I think that the balance aspect that the effort and relaxation, learning how to stand still, that really changed me personally a lot where I just am more aware of those two sides of the coin, right? The effort and the relaxation. So that really um, changed my approach to just how I lived my, how I lived my life and how I approach things and, and paying attention to, do I have more in me or you know do I need to rest? And for me, that's always the, the harder of the two. I think what really changed uh, the sort of, I guess, outward trajectory is that I met a friend named Jerome Armstrong who was interested in researching yoga from the Calcutta area, specifically from Gosha's college. And Jerome Armstrong found this lost manuscript by Buddha Bose, who was a very early student of Vishnu Ghosh. And this manuscript had never been published, but Jerome happened to find it. It had been purchased by an art collector. And mm -hmm. so Jerome decided to go to Calcutta, just kind of show up there and see what he could find. 
relating to this manuscript and to see if we could find the family of the author, Buddha Bose, and try to publish it. And so he, you know, again, I think these things sort of happen nonchalantly. You don't think much of it at the time, but he just kind of said, I'm going to Calcutta. Do you want to come with? <laughs> and so I said, yes, of course I want to come with. And Scott came as well. Um, but that was really what changed the trajectory because we worked to edit and publish that manuscript, as you had mentioned at the beginning. And we met the Ghosh family and we met Buddha Bose's family. And one thing has really just led to the next where we've become really interested in um, illuminating more of that history, um, specifically yoga history from, from Calcutta and the, the Ghosh sort of students and trying to uncover as much of that as we can and share it with people that are interested. So that is what sort of changed things for me. Um, I went from teaching classes locally to then traveling and teaching ideas about the history and what the significance of these manuscripts were and um, and then working on the practice manuals as well. So to bring in the practice aspect along with the history. And from there on, it, one thing has just led to the next. So I forgot to, to ask you, of course, the, the very important question is how you met your husband, <laughs> oh, Scott, sure. because you guys usually work as a team. And normally I would have had you guys on together, but Scott wasn't yes. available, which is totally fine because I love to just talk to you guys anyway. But um, yeah. yeah, just give us a little bit of that, how you guys met, because it's also very unusual for two people to meet and then become both passionate in the same thing. I mean, how great is that? It's very unusual. It's, it's yeah, and I don't, I don't realize how unusual it is all the time. It just I take, take it as it is, I guess, maybe for granted. But when we met, we were both working in music. Um, Scott's also a musician. He's a music composer. And so we both met because we were in that sort of Madison or Midwest um, music world. And we worked uh, in music together actually for a while. And then we both started practicing yoga around the same time. And then a lot of these things have just unfolded that we've, um, you know, we were both able to go to Calcutta on that first trip with Jerome. And so it's evolved that now we're both researching yoga in various ways and teaching together and and working together so yeah it is strange how that's unfolded and i would not have seen that coming certainly yeah i mean what a unbelievable thing that you guys have been able to bridge that gap between right you know the you know what the what i would call it the western younger generation to the original you know, uh, people yeah. in India yeah. who it's a whole different world. I mean, I remember right. when I was at the teacher training and I would hear these names and hear talking about India and all of this, it would be something in my mind that was like, oh my God, I will never be able to go there. I'll never understand it, you know? Right. But so for you and Scott to be able to bridge that gap and to actually, you know, be there, go there, participate, I mean, and bring it back to us really. So mm -hmm. you can talk to us. In, in ways that we understand, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is, is a phenomenal, yeah, it's a phenomenal thing. Well, I think that's one thing that that is meaningful to us and that we take seriously also is that I think it was quite lucky that we started as everyone starts, so just practitioners. And that that relationship to the practice was really important to us and still is. But it also now having gone to India and like you say, tried to study some more of these foreign ideas and things that don't necessarily fit in a Western context in this time in history, being able to, to remember and be that practitioner, you know, remember what it feels like. And we still are practitioners living in this time, take class, practice, and always having that to draw from, I think really has helped us frame it in our own minds and also hopefully you know helps us try to communicate with others because it can be just overwhelming to try to hear somebody talk or pick up a book or something that you don't have any way to relate to it so right. that's a that's something that we take really seriously is that you know knowledge or history or or anything 
doesn't help unless it helps, <laughs> you know, it doesn't help unless people understand it. Um, okay. So that's interesting you bring that up and, and it's such an important point. Good, good, good. As a teacher now and scholar and everything else that you're doing, what has been the most rewarding part of the experience for you? Sure. I mean, I think so much of it is really rewarding. And what what we were just talking about is kind of going in between these worlds for me is really rewarding, actually, that mm -hmm. I, I like to try to I don't know if it's if it's chameleon or what it is to try to fit in different places and try to understand people as they are, you know, and and obviously I think we, we can do that anywhere that we are. It doesn't need to be somewhere as, as distant as India, but it's certainly the case there that it takes a lot of time and reflection to try to understand what someone's talking about um, and what their history is and what their, their sort of heritage is. And I like going in between those worlds and trying to then be in, you know, New York city, for example, with you and your, studio and try to like what can we learn and what can we integrate and for me it's really rewarding to get to go between those those worlds and to share the yoga with so many different people with who all have a different perspective um, that's really rewarding to me wonderful yeah it must be exciting you know to have that mm -hmm. kind of life where it enables you to actually travel all over the world and share your experience yeah yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Now um, you are participating in our teacher training and mm -hmm. you have, you and Scott have your own teacher trainings and your own manuals and you do like, a, you know, you're experts in a million different things, but we're going to, we're bringing you into focus because we, I, you know, I really enjoy having different, you know, people participating because everybody has something different to offer. Mm -hmm. So even though I know that you can offer a lot of different aspects of the training. Um, what are you going to be sort of focusing in on? So we are focusing in on traditions of history and philosophy about yoga. And we're going to try to span a long period of time, about 2000 years of yoga history, to think about where this thing called yoga comes from and what it has meant throughout different points in history. And we're super excited about doing this for your training because this is a topic that we really love talking about and love sharing with people. Because I think we all come to yoga nowadays with this idea of what yoga is. And I have my idea, you have your idea, everyone has this idea of if you say yoga, what is it that somebody imagines or what is it that somebody thinks? And what we personally think to be yoga is, of course, very important. And that's that's how we interact with it. But it is a term and a concept and an idea and a set of practices that has been shifting constantly throughout time. So what we want to do for this training is illuminate those different meanings and try to just uh, shine some light on what it could mean at a different point in time to a different group or a different region and how those meanings have changed and then come to something that we recognize as yoga today. I love it. I love it. And also you of course have a really good um, way of describing the, our actual lineage, the hot yoga lineage. Yes, exactly. It's like yeah. real personal experience, literally, you know, yep. being there. So that's, that's definitely. Also very exciting as well. Definitely. Okay, so listen, I'm really happy to have had the chance to, you know, talk with you about all of these things. And of course, there's more and more to come and more things to discuss. But uh, absolutely, of your time and I just appreciate our conversation. And we all look forward to working with you. And, uh, and onward we go, right? Of course. Thank you so much, Donna. It's such a treat to talk with you and so looking forward to the next training. And we're, Scott and I are both really glad that we get to participate again. It's a treat for us. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Love it.